In this lab, we use HTTP2 to talk to the front end, but the front end is downgrading our requests to HTTP1.1 to talk to the back end. And this is incredibly common, and it renders the setup vulnerable to request smuggling because the essence of request smuggling is that the front end and back end disagree about which mechanism to use to determine content length. And because the front end server is rewriting our HTTP2 request into an HTTP1.1 request without actually verifying whether the content length we specified is correct, the front end and back end are vulnerable to request smuggling. I'll also show you how to automate the final part of the lab with Burp Intruder, because if you do it manually, unless you get really lucky, it might take you a long time to solve the lab. But let's get started. I'm on the homepage of the application here, and we're targeting the root endpoint. So I'm going to switch to Burp and go to proxy and HTTP history and grab the get slash request for the root endpoint and send it to repeater and switch to repeater. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the request method here and switch it over to post. Then I'm going to clean up the unnecessary headers, so anything above content type and underneath the host header. Next thing I'm going to do is turn on uh, new lines and show non-printable characters, because that's quite handy for request smuggling in general. I'm also going to turn off update content length automatically, because we want to control that ourselves to um, send a differential response and test for the vulnerability for request smuggling. And then here in the request body, what we want to do is I'm going to define a request body parameter x for a value of 1. And that will be where our normal content ends. So this is uh, content length 5, because we have 1, 2, 3. And then the carriage return line feed, which is uh, 2 bytes in itself. So 3 plus 2 is 5. And underneath this, we're going to do our request smuggling. So for the differential response, what we want to do is we want to request something that doesn't exist using HTTP 1.1. And I also have to set a xignore header for a value of x, but not followed by a new line, because we want the normal request to be appended here. So this will become our attack request. And then I'm going to go back to proxy and send another copy of this get slash request to repeater and switch to repeater. And this will become our normal request. So what we want to do if, if I copy everything here, Setting the xignore header like this, um, once we've sent our attack request, the normal request when we send it will be appended like this. And this ensures that we don't have a duplicate uh, get request method here. Otherwise, if we append the new line here, then the normal request is appended like this, and you have a duplicate get request method. So that's not good. So make sure that you don't have a new line after xignore x here. So let's send this attack request, and we get a 200 OK. Then go to our normal request and send it as well. And we get a 404 not found. So that confirms the request smuggling vulnerability. You might find if you do this a couple of times that sometimes you won't get a 404. You'll actually get a 200. So let me, yeah, like we did here. And that just means the lab victim is also browsing the website in the background. So sometimes when you send your attack request, the lab victim's get request uh, after you've sent your attack request will actually be appended to the um, prefix that we've poisoned the backend with here before you've sent your normal request. And that's why sometimes you might see a 200 OK here. But that's absolutely normal and nothing to worry about. As long as you get a couple of 404s when you send your attack request, normal request pairs, that confirms the vulnerability, and you're good to continue after that. Now, the reason that this HTTP request smuggling attack works is because the HTTP2 RFC states that it's not necessary to include a content length header here because the content length is derived from the HTTP2's built-in length mechanism. But the HTTP2 RFC also states that you're allowed to set a content length header, as long as it's correct and matches the length from the built-in mechanism. The issue is, and that's what we're seeing in this lab, is that not all front-end implementations actually check that it's correct. And some of them, like the one in this lab, simply trust the value that we've set here and pass it on to the backend server. Now, to exploit this, we need to redirect the lab victim to our exploit server and give them a JavaScript alert pop-up containing document.cookie. So to do that, we need to find an on-site redirect and turn it into an off-site redirect. So let's look for a redirect. Uh, and one you can always try is excluding the terminating slash within a folder, because some web servers actually um, do a 302 redirect for that if you omit the terminating slash and add it back in through a 302 redirect. So if I go back to proxy and HTTP history, you can see there's a few JavaScript files here that are being uh, requested through a GET request. And if you just pick one of them here, like uh, this one, and send it to repeater, what you can do, so I'm going to send this request, and we get the response for the JavaScript file. But if you omit the file name itself and just go to the folder, you'll see that you get a 404 because the resource doesn't exist. But if you omit the terminating slash for a folder, 
you'll see that this web server implementation actually sends a 302 redirect, and it adds or appends the uh, terminating slash once again. So all we have to do is turn this on-site redirect, which is using the HTTP host header of our lab, into an off-site redirect, which uses the HTTP host header of our exploit server. But as you can see, if we would alter the host header here and just remove one letter and send a request again, we get an invalid host error. And that's because the front end needs a correct host header to be able to send it to the correct backend server. But what we can do is we can combine it with our request smuggling to make it work. So I'm going to copy this and then go to our attack request. And instead of the uh, get request for something that doesn't exist here, I'm just going to put this get request for the JS folder without the terminating slash. And then I'm just going to add a host header for, let's say, example.com, if I can type, and send this. And this actually won't work, but I'll show you why. So we get a 302 found now when we send our normal request, but it's still using the old host header. And this is because if I copy everything here again and go to our attack request, and just paste it after here, you can see that a second host header is being added because, yeah, the request, the double request method issue is fixed, but there's a second host header here from our normal request. Normally, that would give an error saying there's a duplicate host header found, but in this lab implementation, it seems like the second host header is actually overriding the custom host header we tried to set here to turn it into an offsite redirect. But that's something we can easily fix. And all we have to do is remove the request that I pasted here. And I'm also going to remove the xignore header here. And instead, what we want to do is we want the normal request to be appended in the body. So I'm going to set a new line here and then set a new request body parameter x for a value of none. And we also need a content length and a content type here. So I'm going to copy the two lines above and paste it here. Now, you can leave content length 5, but the minimum you should set it to is 3 because we have two bytes here, the x and the equal sign. And we want at least one byte from our normal request to be appended to the prefix that we poisoned the backend with here. So now if we send this attack request and then go to our normal request and send it, we get a 302 found, but you can see we've successfully turned it into an offsite redirect because we're going to example.com and resources uh, JS. So let's exploit this. I'm going to switch back to the lab and go to our exploit server. And then instead of application JavaScript, we want to change this into text JavaScript. And then in the body, we want to send an alert for document.cookie and, and with a semicolon. And then for the path, I'm going to go back to burp. And we want the path resources uh, JS with the terminating slash. So I'm going to go back here and paste that. And make sure there's a, a slash at the beginning as well for the root. And then store this. And then go up here and copy the host header for our exploit server and switch back to burp. Go to the attack request. So instead of example.com here, we want the host header for our exploit server. And that looks OK, so let's send this and then follow it up with our normal request. And we get a 302 found to our exploit server. So let's switch to the lab. We haven't solved it yet, but that's completely normal because when we sent our attack request and followed it up with our normal request, we got a 302 redirect, which means we ate up our own attack request and the prefix that we poisoned the backend with. We need to keep doing that until we see uh, a 200 response to our normal request, because that would mean that the lab victim was browsing the site, and the lab victim's request was actually appended to our attack request. So we just have to keep repeating the process of sending an attack request and follow it up with a normal request until we get a 200, and then check back here in the lab and see if we solved it. So let's try that. I'm going to switch back to burp and go to our attack request and send it again and follow it up with our normal request. We got a 302 found, so attack request again, normal request, attack request, normal request, and we get a 200 OK. Switch back to the lab, and we haven't solved it yet. And that's because the lab victim also has to be using or requesting a JavaScript file for this exploit to work. Otherwise, the alert document cookie won't load for the victim. So we can keep doing this manually, but an easier way is actually to go back to Burp and just automate this process of sending multiple attack requests and then checking back. So I'm going to go to the attack request, and instead I'm going to send it to Intruder and then switch to Intruder. So we, want, we don't want to add any payload markers here because we wanted to keep the request as is, and we want to use uh, the sniper attack type. But for payload, because we don't want to modify um, the request that we send, we're going to pick null payload, and we're going to generate, let's say, uh, a 1,000 payloads. And then in the settings, important thing is also to turn off update content length header automatically, because if we go back here, we want to make sure that Intruder isn't updating the content length here. Otherwise, that would break our request smuggling. 
And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the resource pool here. And then I'm going to create a new resource pool with maximum concurrent requests set to one and the delay between the requests set to 300. And then I'm going to start this attack. And now we're just waiting for the lab to complete by itself. So once you see that there are two 200 requests sent in a row, that means that one of the requests was intercepted um, or attack request was intercepted by the uh, lab victim, as it was the case here. So let's check back in the lab. And yeah, actually, you can see we've, we've solved it now. So rather than sending all these uh, attack requests and normal requests um, one by one, it's actually easier just to automate this process. And basically, you can just let this run until the lab completes by itself, as it did for me, and then uh, you're good to go. I hope this was helpful to you, and thank you for watching.